Yeah, so uh, good afternoon. My name is Jean Joaquin from uh, the Erasmus Plus program in Charles University in Prague. And uh, I have two bad news for you. The uh, first one is that I didn't prepare a PowerPoint because I thought that kind of poster would be here somewhere, but never mind. Uh, the second one is that uh, there is a keyword missing in the description. So it's Cold War Agriculture Museums. And the museums are going to be the most important part of it. So anyway, uh, back to agriculture. Agriculture with its uh, cloudy and diffuse origins, its spasmodic and often localized development, its enormous scale, is often naturalized or at best treated as an accessory to nature itself and becomes something of a backdrop rather than a central arena of human history. And some even say that nowadays you live in a time of agricultural ignorance. Uh, nevertheless, uh, people take children to petting zoos and food team exhibitions are becoming more and more popular. Open-air museums give us a glimpse of an idealized, long-lost uh, past, and biotechnology is no stranger to science museums. The genealogy of agricultural museums is complex. The Skansen Open-Air Museum in Stockholm, a folklore museum, and the Hungarian Agricultural Museum in Budapest, a uh, technical museum, uh, both founded in the 1890s, were the two pioneer institutions of this kind, acting as role models for later initiatives around Europe and beyond. The bipolar ancestry reflects the variety of approaches possible still today in the field of agricultural museology. One can find agriculture-related museums focused on technical matters, food and nutrition, folklore, specific industries, etc. And uh, furthermore, the museographic approaches also vary, and uh, we can find both reenactments of traditional pr practices or science center inspired displays of environmental matters. And my research concerns the development of agricultural museology in Europe throughout the second half of the 20th century, with special attention to the establishment of knowledge transfer networks, the role of experts, the transfer of theories and concepts, and the emergence of common, common policy issues. Issues. Uh, thus, establishing a transnational historical geography of agricultural museology. And there's some maps in my poster, so you'll be able to see the geography there. A uh, key subject of this research is the International Association of Agricultural Museums, the AIMA, from its French name, founded in 1966 in Czechoslovakia and involving actors in both sides of the Iron Curtain. The journal of this organization, published between 1966 and 1989, constitutes an important narrative source of the ideas, plans, and ambitions of museologists and historians of agriculture. Starting in 1966, every two or three years, the AIMA organized international congresses, which were alternately organized by West and East Bloc countries. These international congresses of agricultural museums attract a multitude of experts, ethnographers, historians, geographers, agricultural engineers, and even occasionally museologists. If we consider the AIMA as one more transnational organ organization concerned with agricultural matters, one can integrate it into a long tradition of expert conferences that date back to the late 19th century. The Czechoslovak National Agri Agricultural Museum uh, took shape immediately after the independence of the state in 1918, becoming one of the leading institutions of its kind in Europe, uh, also a technical museum like the one in Budapest. Its exhibitions were not considered as an ethnographic display of artifacts, but as a practical educational tool to be used in the technical development of the new independent state. The Czechoslovak National Agricultural Museum started floating the idea of creating an international organiza organization of agricultural museums in the 1930s, promoting a first survey of these kind of institutions. The project was postponed by the Second World War and the political vicissitudes of post-war Eastern Europe, but throughout the 1950s, increasing contacts between agricultural museums allowed for the organization of conferences, meetings, and field visits involving staff of uh, different countries, uh, both Central and Northern Europe. The renewal of contacts between agricultural museums was in part occasioned by the common interest of museums of technical agriculture and open-air museums in the history and cataloging of agricultural implements, a meeting point of ethnologists, agricultural engineers, and historians. The, creating the creation of the AIMA resulted from the cooperation between the Czechoslovak and the Hungarian Museums of Agriculture, uh, the latter considered as one of the oldest and most comprehensive in the world. Uh, Zdenek Tempir, a former director, director of the Czechoslovak Museum and one of the founders of the association, chronicled in the 1990s its creation as a continuation of the museum's pre-war plans 
and the triumph of international cooperation at a time of political division. However, Ted Collins, this English connection here, a former director of the Museum of English Rural Life, remarked that most papers were actually unimaginative and concerned with familiar agricultural history themes, with possible divisive topics like socialist agriculture or farm collectivization being mostly absent from the Congresses. Collins further notes the discomfort of Western delegations with the hard line and authoritative style of their Eastern counterparts and the structure of the organization itself. Nonetheless, both uh, Collins and Tempe agree that AIMA was successful in establishing bridges between the academic and museal sectors of the two blocks. The statutes of the AIMA were jointly written by Tempe, Vratislav Schmelaus, also from the Czechoslovak Museum, and Gunter Franz, director of the Oanheim's University Institute of Agricultural History in West Germany. And interestingly enough, uh, Gunter Franz used to be a very respected uh, well, national socialist intellectual, and then somehow managed to make a quite impressive transition to the post-war period. Uh, it is quite noticeable that there was an attempt to balance the influence of the we Western and Eastern blocs inside of the AIMA. Uh, and Soviet representations uh, were quite, uh, and quite un unexpectedly, were small and unremarkable. And Russian, despite being one of the official languages of the organization, was practically never used. And you can see it from the journal and from the uh, quite some descriptions of the Congresses. The nucleus of the AIMA was constituted by national museums of agriculture with a strong technical emphasis. This did not discourage Scandinavian and Western European ethnology and open-air museums from taking part in the initiative, but conflicting perspectives of museum work meant that competi competing organizations focused specifically on this kind of museums were soon created. The proceedings of the several congresses, as well as other contemporary sources, allow us to identify thematic and theoretical trends for instance, the decreasing interest in matters connected with the development of agricultural technology and the gradual popularization of terms related with uh, ecology and environmental conservation. And it's, I have a graph in my panel, and you can check it. Uh, the history of the creation and development of the AIMA and of the theoretical debates that took place within it is, in my opinion, not an idle exercise of institutional history, chronicling past academic intrigues, and there were plenty in this organization, but a relevant matter to be researched at a time when environmental, agricultural, and food-related issues are increasingly under the spotlight. And it stands as essential to know the history and development of museums dedicated to these matters in order to better understand the complex crossroads in which they stand still today. So thank you for your attention.